Texas, the man you believe killed President Kennedy. I think we have the right man. He was cuffed, fingerprinted, booked for murder. Does he confess anything? No. Come on, you man. the president? But before he could be tried. I don't know what this is all about. Before he was found innocent or proven guilty. The Oswald has been tried. He was silenced forever. The world may never know the truth about the crime of the century. Now his case goes to court. Is he innocent or guilty? A&E presents The Trial of the Harvey Oswald. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. It's a question that has stirred up passionate debate for years in America. Did Lee Harvey Oswald kill President Kennedy? This series, The Trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, is an attempt to demonstrate what would have happened if Oswald had his day in court. The witnesses are real, the lawyers are real, and the jury is made up of real citizens of Dallas, Texas. In our first installment, we heard opening arguments from both sides, and then prosecuting attorney Vincent Bugliosi called a number of eyewitnesses to the stand. This, our second broadcast, joins the trial at that point. The defense attorney is Jerry Spence. Government calls Marion Baker. Baker, if you would, please, if you'd come forward. You were sworn earlier as a witness, were you not, sir? Yes, sir, I was. Fine, thank you. Just have a seat right over here. Tell us your name, please. Marion L. Baker. Directing your attention to the date, November the 22nd, 1963, the day of the assassination. Were you a police officer with the Dallas Police Department? Yes, sir, I was. Were you assigned to ride a motorcycle in a presidential motorcade that day? Yes, sir. The presidential limousine eventually turned left on Elm from Houston Street? Yes, sir, it did. What's the next thing that happened? At this time, I heard three shots. Exhibit F? With the pointer, would you please show the jury on the diagram approximately where you were on Houston Street when you heard these three shots? Okay, about this area right here. All right, and you heard three shots at that point. Do you have any sense as to where these shots were fired from? Approximately this building here. The book depository building? Yes, sir. After you heard these three shots, what's the next thing that you did? I rode my motorcycle to the northwest corner, right about here. All right. And parked it and ran inside. All right. Exhibit H, Mr. Baker. Now on the... Uh, on the easel, Mr. Baker, is a floor plan purportedly of the second floor of the book depository building. Do you recognize this floor plan as being the second floor? Yes, I do. With your pointer, would you ind indicate to the jury what happened when you reached the second floor landing? Right here, on the second floor landing, as I came out of the stairways, there was a door facing me. And through this window in the door, I saw a movement. And then I went over and opened the door and I saw this man walking away from me. What did okay. you say to him, if anything? I called to him and uh, said, uh, come here. He turned around and started walking back towards me. Okay. Was Mr. Truly at your side? Yes, sir. Mr. Truly was at my side. That's the superintendent of the building? Yes, sir, it is. Did you ask him who the man was? Yes, sir, I did. He told you it was Lee Oswald? Yes, sir. Did he appear out of breath? No, sir. Do you recall how he was dressed? No, sir. Mr. Baker, other than Lee Harvey Oswald, did you see anyone else at all on the second floor? No, sir. You may sit down, sir. Mr. Baker, as I understand it, at a later time, March the 20th, 1964, you timed how long it would have taken Mr. Oswald, if he had fired the shots from the southeasternmost window of the sixth floor, to have gotten down to the second floor lunchroom where you confronted him. Is that correct? That's correct. You determined that Oswald would have had enough time to get to where you confronted him. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Baker. No further questions. Mr. Spence? Thanks, Judge. Mr. Baker, um, when you got to the Texas bookstore, Lee was in the um, lunchroom, wasn't he? Yes, sir. And uh, may I have exhibit uh, uh, 20A? Was he inside the room that we're looking at now? Yes, sir. He wasn't running? No, sir. But did he seem excited? No, sir. Seemed nervous? No, sir. 
Well, a man who is neither excited nor nervous nor panting is not exactly acting in a way you would expect somebody who had just seconds before killed the President of the United States you know, by shooting this... him three times with a man liquor rifle. Is Isn't this that final true? summation now or is this cross examination? Just, just, just a minute, if you will. Yeah, I object. Uh, it's final summation. He's not going to have anything to say during his final summation, Your Honor. Well, that's what he's been doing in his cross examination. Can you answer the question yes or no? <clears throat> You remember the question, sir? Did he Repeat. act like a man that Repeat. just shot the president? We can no, get sir. it a lot quicker. Thank no, you. sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Baker, for coming. Redirect. No further questions. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you very much, Mr. Baker. Call your next witness. The government calls Ted Kellaway. Have a seat right over here in the witness chair, if you would, please, sir. Have a seat there, please. Tell us your name. <clears throat> My name's Ted Calloway. Thank you. Mr. Calloway, your present occupation, sir? I'm a used car dealer. Okay. Directing your attention back to the date, November the 22nd, 1963, the date President Kennedy was assassinated. Were you employed as the used car manager at Harris Brothers Auto Sales, located at 501 East Jefferson Boulevard in Dallas? That's correct. Around 1.15 p.m. on that date, will you tell the jury where you were and what you heard at that time? I was standing on the front porch of our office, and when I heard what sounded like five pistol shots. Okay, could you pick up the pointer there by your right hand and uh, indicate on the diagram where you were when you heard the shots and where the shots appeared to be coming from? I was right here on this porch. All right. And the shots sounded like they were coming from this direction on 10th Street. Okay. Now, when you heard these shots, uh, what did you do at that point? I ran out to the sidewalk on Patton Street. Okay. Would you use your pointer to point out the locations involved? Yes, I just ran from here out to the sidewalk. Okay. Again, with the pointer, would you tell the jury what you observed at that point? I saw a man running from this front yard on 10th Street across the street, which would be the west side of Patton. Did he have anything in either of his hands? Yes, sir. He had a pistol in his right hand. And uh, Did you get a good, clear view of him? Very good view. Did you talk to him at all? Yes, sir. What did you say to him, and what did he say to you, if anything? I hollered at him. I said, hey, man, what the hell's going on? And he slowed almost to a halt, turned in my direction, still had his pistol in his direction. He said something to me, which I couldn't understand it. Then he proceeded to run toward Jefferson through this front yard right here and proceed west on 10th on Jefferson Street. Let's take a look at the photo of Oswald. Looking at Lee Harvey Oswald, is he or is he not the man that you saw that day? That's the man, yes, sir. Any question in your mind about that, sir? None whatsoever. Okay, you may sit down here. Thank you. After the man ran past you, after Oswald ran past you, then what did you do, sir? That's what I ran toward yes. the corner of 10th and Patton and to see what was going on, and that's where I saw the police squad car and... Officer Tippett lying in front of the squad car. Did he appear to be dead at that time? He did. And what did you do? I leaned over and felt his pulse at his throat. Then I got on, uh, found old pulse, and I got on the police radio and told them that an officer had been killed. They told me, yes, they had already heard about it, to stay off the air. Mr. Kellaway, on the night of the Tippett murder, did you go to a lineup at the Dallas Police Department around 6.30 p.m.? Yes, sir, I did. How many men were in the lineup? Four. Were all four men of the uh, approximate same age, height, and weight? They were. What happened when the four men stepped out in front of you? Well, I recognized Oswald right away as a man that I'd seen running uh, down Patton. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Spence? Now, Mr. Calloway, um... You did perform an, a, a lineup, isn't that true? Went to the police line? They did a lineup, didn't they? Right. And before they put you, let you identify this, do you think they were being totally fair and open about it? 
They sure were. I mean, they didn't give you any hints of any kind, did they? No, sir. I mean, they didn't say anything to you that would lead you to believe that the man that, uh, that you saw was the man who was supposedly killed the president, did they? No, sir. They didn't I can say tell you exactly you. what they said. They didn't wait say... Wait a while, wait a while. He has something to say, Mr. Spence. Just, yes, just he, said a I, he answered it. No, but he answered the question. Let me overrule, Mr. Gugliosi. He didn't say to you, quote, the officer didn't say to you, quote, we want to be sure. We want to try to wrap him up real tight on killing this officer. We think he is the same one that shot the president. And if we can wrap him up tight on killing this officer, we have got him. Didn't they say that to you? That is almost word to word what uh, the chief of detectives, Will Fritz, told me, but he preceded his remark was, but be sure, take your time, get a good look at him, do not make an identification unless you are absolutely positive. And then after he gave you that, he said, we want to be sure, we want to try to officer we think he's the same one that shot the president right Mr. Kirk, intermittent frames from 160 through 169 are now going to be put on the screen, and would you please point out to the jury your observations about these frames? Okay, to orientate the jury, I'm going to use the light pen here and draw a circle around uh, Governor Conley. Uh, you will note that Governor Conley is looking in this direction. What you're going to see now is equivalent to a half second. And I would ask you to try to concentrate just on Governor Conley. You will note now that Governor Conley is now looking in this direction, back over his right shoulder, back up towards the uh, scoop book depository. And all of this took place in half a second. Your panel concluded that this first bullet then did not hit either Kennedy or Conley, is that correct? That's correct. Would you point out to the jury what you see or saw that caused you to conclude that the president was physically reacting to being hit by the first of the two bullets that hit him? Okay, to orientate the jury, I'll first fix uh, Governor Conley for you. And that's Governor Conley. You will note that he still turned and faced into his right. I'll clear the screen. And now we have Governor, uh, President Kennedy. His elbow presently is resting right here on the uh, side of the limousine. And to orientate you, this area right here is the cuff of his sleeve. Can we have next frame, please? All right. Now you see that the president's arm here is super extended. We interpreted this to be a stimulus. This happened an eighteenth of a second. So that's the, the president physically reacting to being hit for the first time, is that correct? That's correct. Would you point out to the jury what caused the majority of the panel to conclude that Governor Connolly was reacting to being hit by the same bullet? Uh, this, is the, this is Governor Connolly. You can see that uh, if I could draw it for you, his, this shoulder is higher than this shoulder. Uh, this is the president here. It's one hand, and this is the other hand. If I could have the next frame, please. Here you can see Governor Conley. Uh, his left shoulder, again, is considerably higher than his right shoulder. He's uh, going down like this, if you would. Uh, the president is here. He's going in up to what I can best describe as the defensive lineman stance, 
Conley then would have been responding or reacting just over a second after Kennedy. Is that correct? That's correct. Change, please. Uh, we see now that the governor has almost turned around. He's facing, actually facing back to the rear. And Mrs. Kennedy now has responded uh, to her husband. And actually, her husband is leaning over in the direction of his wife. Change. This is 312, and this is by far one of the clearer frames, and it shows the orientation of the president, and you can also see that Ms. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Connolly now is starting to lean back on his wife. She actually is pulling him back towards her. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the headshot at 313. Uh, uh, this mask that we see here is... Uh, what the medical people call particulate matter, but us lay people will call brain tissue, uh, blood, and other items uh, that's, that's being emitted from the president's head. Okay. Looking at frame 313 is one of the uh, points that caused your panel to conclude the shot came from the rear of the fact that the spray of brain matter is all, all to the front. Yes, that's correct. Did your panel prepare a high contrast photo of that frame 313? Yes, sir, we did. We put that on the screen? You can see that the particulate matter is going forward uh, of the present uh, coming in this direction. You can see the cone here of mass is going in a forward direction. In addition to the spray of brain matter all to the front, uh, do frames 313 and 314 actually show the president's head being pushed forward slightly by the momentum of the bullet? Yes, it does. Can we see those frames now and point that out to the jury? Again, this is uh, frame 312, and I would ask the jury to note that this is the rear seat, the back of the seat, and of course this is the, the body, uh, the torso of the president at 312. 313, please. We concluded that there is a definite space opening there between the seat and the president at 313, uh, moving forward. 314, please. 314, the space is larger. So he's moving forward he's at moving 313 and 314. Yes. At 315, starts there, to go back. He starts to go back. 316, he goes back a little bit more. 317, and he's almost back to the seat, as you can see there. Did your panel conclude that this head snap to the rear or whatever it is was caused as some of the critics have contended by a bullet from the front no sir we did not so the three shots were fired according to the photographic evidence in approximately eight and two tenths seconds is that correct uh not taking consideration that we don't know exactly when governor Connolly heard the uh shot to go off but a minimum of 8.2 seconds that's correct was there any other photographic evidence indicating to your panel shots from the rear yes sir could those exhibits be shown on the screen and could you point it out to the jury what caused your panel to conclude that yes. shots came from the rear? This is one of the Sapruder films and this is actually before uh, the president uh, was shot. As a matter of fact, you can see him here quite clearly in his hand, arm is resting on the side of the vehicle waving. My attention is drawn to this little girl right here. She's actually running parallel to the presidential limousine. But you can see already and she's looking back over her right shoulder at something. The most important event in her life, she's taking her head, her, her vision away from the president. Next, vision, next slide, please. You can see now that the president is continuing on down the street, and the little girl is, stood, is standing completely still with her hands beside her, and she's looking back up towards the school book depository. Okay, can we put the backyard photo series on the uh, screen? Mr. Kirk, uh, this appears to be a photograph of Oswald holding a rifle with a, a revolver in his holster, and I believe he's holding two newspapers up. Uh, Mr. Oswald told Captain Fritz during his interrogation that that was not he in that photograph. It was his head, but it was superimposed upon someone else's body. Did your uh, photographic panel address itself to that issue? Well, we were asked to identify whether or not the photograph was faked or not. Can I have a next slide, please? The, uh, the allegation was that this area in here was, a cre was created by montage. In other words, that part of Oswald's face being matched up to a figure, not Oswald, below the chin line. And a lot of the critics interpreted this line as being signs of a montage. Next slide up, please. 
But when we look at the first generation photograph, in other words, the photograph made off of the negative that was recovered by the Warren Commission, we see that line is not there. But as you copy photographs and increase contrast, anytime you have a shadow, it creates the illusion of being a line. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. No further questions. Cross-examination of the witness when the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald returns. It's over. The jury will be asked to reach a verdict. Court, please. Ipsy. Sergeant Kirk. You've, uh, you've looked here during the course of, um, of your death testimony uh, for this jury, you've looked at some enhanced, high-contrast analyses that were made. Could we have that so that the jury could see it again? It's the enhanced one, you know, the one that looks like a balloon being squirted. Just to make it simple, if we have a balloon in our hand, full of water, and I smash it from this direction until it bursts, the water very may, may well come out against the direction of my fist. Isn't that true? Only if the hole is large enough for the water to come back out at you. Thank you. The hole in the president's head was almost four inches, four square inches. Isn't that true? Entrance or exit? The hole in the side of his head. The exit, yes. Now, Conley told you, or provided information for the committee, did he not, that the first bullet hit the president, that he was not hit by the first bullet that hit the president, that he was hit by a separate second bullet. That's not his testimony. <clears throat> Governor Conley did not testify to that, Your Honor. It's a mischaracterization of his testimony. All right. So now at this time, I'd like to have the Conley uh, uh, interview uh, presented to the jury so that the jury Talk can decide <clears throat> Talking themselves. about his testimony before the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee. I don't know about any private interview. His interview was a public interview, Your Honor. The court's seen it. It's proper under these circumstances. I have seen the interview, and I think it's proper cross examining I will allow it. Thank you. Would you produce the Conley interview, let's, please? Let's, let's move on, yes. counsel, if you would, please. It's ready. I am convinced beyond any question of a doubt that the first shot that was fired did not hit me. Then I was hit. And I was not then, and I'm not, I have no memory, no recollection of the sound of the shot that hit me. And beyond any question of a doubt, the third shot did not hit me. Now, Ms. Conley has a very definite feeling, a very strong conviction, that the first shot that was fired hit the president. The second shot that was fired hit me third shot that was fired hit the president. But unquestionably, when the first shot was fired, I recognized it as a shot. I thought of nothing else but that it was a rifle shot. Uh, I turned to my right. I had time to think. I had time to react. And I turned to my right to look back over my right shoulder to see if I could see anything unusual, and particularly to see if I could catch him out of the corner of my eye. Uh, I did not see the president out of the corner of my eye, and I was in the process of turning back to look over my left shoulder and had, had about come to the point where I was looking straight forward again when I felt the impact of the bullet that hit me. Thank you. Now, I'd like to play the Zapruder film, and I ask the jury to please concentrate on Governor Conley because we've just heard his testimony. Mm. Watched Governor Conley. Watch him lurch back. There. Thank you. Now, 
Could you bring up frame 312? Do you see the relationship of Mrs. Um, of Mrs. Kennedy's face to the president? Mr. Kirk? Yes, I do. And at the time he's being hit in the head, wherever it hits him in the head, her face is in the very proximity of his face, is it not? It's to one side of his face. Um, as a matter of fact, if the bullet came from the rear, Mr. Kirk, and splashed all of the particulate matter out in front, wouldn't it have covered her face almost totally with that particulate matter? Not necessarily. Thank you. That's all I need of that. Mr. Kirk, you, you, uh, you were talking about a picture of Mr. Oswald, remember, holding the gun. Um, well, that picture showed him with a rifle and a pistol and a communist newspaper. Isn't that true? Don't know about the pol politics of the newspaper, but you're basically right. Yes. yes. It was all of the evidence that was needed in one picture to convict Lee Oswald if somebody found the picture. Isn't that true? No. Now, I want to ask you a simple question. Have you ever examined a photograph, Mr. Kirk, that was phonied up by the CIA? I see you laugh. I, no, I'm not laughing. I don't find it amusing. First of all, if I found a phony photograph, how would I know it was done by the CIA? Well, I don't know. Have you ever examined a photograph that, uh, that uh, the CIA phonied up? To your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. Have you ever seen one that was messed with by the KGB? I have no way of knowing. That's right. You really don't know, do you, Mr. Kirk, how sophisticated the methods of the KGB and the CIA are in making fake photographs. Isn't that true? No. You don't know, do you? Yes, I do. Do you make room for the possibility that the CIA or the KGB could fool you? No. You don't think they could? No. Thank you. Mr. Kirk, thank you very much. Uh, you may step down. Mr. Bugliosi, call your next witness, please. Dr. Charles Petty. If you would, please. Doctor, if you'd come forward. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in the proceedings before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Take a seat in the witness stand, please. Right around there. Thank you, Doctor. May the court please... Uh... The defense asked the court permission to have uh, our expert, Dr. Brady, uh, enter the courtroom and, uh, and be present during Dr. Petty's testimony. No objection, Your Honor. Oh, fine. Thank you. Dr. Petty, were you one of nine forensic pathologists from around the country chosen by the House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1977 to serve on the autopsy panel reinvestigating the assassination of President Kennedy? I was. And what was the conclusion your panel came to as to how many bullets struck the president, their point of entry, and the path they took through the president's body? Uh, my conclusion and the conclusion of the panel was that the president was struck by two bullets, uh, one entering the right upper back and exiting in the front of the neck, uh, the other entering the right back of the head and exiting in the uh, what we call the right frontal area, that is the front and side of the head. Is there any doubt in your mind, doctor, whatsoever, that both bullets that struck the president came from the rear and no bullet struck him from the front? Uh, none whatsoever. Would you explain to the best of your knowledge to the jury what happened once the bullet entered the president's head? The bullet began to break up into small fragments broke the skull up into fragments and blasted out uh, through the right frontal part of the head. Exhibit 102. What's that? Uh, this is a diagram of the skull showing the point of entrance in the back of the president's head and the exit in the right frontal area. 
Doctors, I'm sure you're well aware one of the principal contention of the critics is that President Kennedy's head snap to the rear around frames 315 to 320 on the Zapruder film means, in the eyes of the critics, to some of them, that he must have been struck by a bullet from the front. You're aware of that contention? Yes, I am. What conclusion did your panel come to with respect to this head snap to the rear? The head snap to the rear, in the view of the panel, was that this was an automatic, involuntary reaction on the part of the president's nerves and muscles. There was a blast inside the head, the nerves were fired off, and the muscles were set into action. The muscles in the back are stronger than the muscles in the front, and so therefore the head moved backward. Let me ask you this, Dr. Petty. Assuming the president ha had been struck by a bullet from the front, make that assumption, could the transference of momentum from that bullet have thrown the president backward, as is shown in frames 315 to 320 of the Zapruder film? No, sir, not in my opinion. And why is that? No, because the head is too heavy. Uh, there is too much, much, too much muscular resistance uh, to movement. So the killings that people see on television uh, and in the movies, uh, which is the only type of killings most people ever see, where the person struck by the bullet very frequently, visibly, and dramatically is propelled backward by the force of the bullets. That's not what actually happens in life when a bullet hits a human being. No, of course not. Dr. Petty, did you also seek to ascertain how many bullets struck Governor Connolly, their point of entry, and the path they followed once they entered his body? Yes. And your panel arrived at a conclusion? That is correct. Did you tell the jury what conclusion your panel reached with respect to Governor Connolly? The panel concluded that the governor was struck in the back, uh, that the bullet uh, circled around the outside of the chest, exited beneath the right nipple, went on to continue through his wrist, and then on into his thigh. The right wrist, the left thigh. Doctor, there has been testimony that Governor Connolly may have reacted up to just over a second after President, President Kennedy reacted. Would that preclude Governor Connolly and President Kennedy being struck by the same bullet? No, not at all. Why not? because people react differently uh, to different bullets. Uh, the bullets may wound people in different areas, and even in the same area, different individuals react in different ways. They may not even know that they've been struck by a bullet. Did your pathology panel conclude that the bullet that entered the president's upper right back and exited the front of his throat was the same bullet that went on and struck Governor Connolly on his back near his right armpit? Yes, the panel came to that conclusion. Exhibit 130? Doctor, now on the screen to your left is the bullet purportedly removed from Governor Connolly's stretcher. Did your panel examine this bullet? Yes. You saw the actual bullet? Yes. Could this bullet have ended up in this relatively pristine condition if it had entered the president's back, exited his throat, then entered Governor Connolly's back near his right armpit, and taken the path through Governor Connolly's body you have just described? Yes, Would course. you explain to the jury how you arrive at this conclusion? Uh, this bullet is a full metal jacket military bullet designed to pass through the soft tissues of an individual exactly as it did in President Kennedy's instance. Uh, it then contacted bone only in two areas. First the rib in Connolly and second uh, the, the wrist bone in Connolly. In neither instance did it penetrate uh, the rib or the wrist bone. Uh, it easily travels through such soft tissues as that without great deformity. Okay, thank you, Doctor. No further questions. The trial of Lee Harvey Oswald will continue in a moment here on A&E. We now return to the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, there are some serious problems with this autopsy, aren't there, Doctor? There are some problems with the autopsy. So yes, let's sir. be honest with this lady, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, and let's tell them. Let's just tell them what the problem was. Did you ever see the brain? No. Do you think it's important for a doctor before he gives his opinion to see the brain, to determine where the course of the bullet was? It would be nice if the brain were available. Now, please. Doctor, let's not be silly. Let's not do that. You're a professional. You're under oath. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury if it isn't essential for you to see the brain. No, it's not essential to see the brain. You didn't see the brain in this case? No, I did not. Do you know where it is? No, I do not. Did you look for it? Well, not really. Did, is, as a matter of fact, 
Well, now, please, doctor, you smile. But as a matter of fact, didn't your committee uh, ask some 20 different people where the brain of the president was? We asked, but we did not look for it. You couldn't find it, could you? No. Nobody came up with it, did they? No. Asked the FBI where the brain of the president was? I don't recall whether the FBI was asked, asked the CIA if produced the brain of the president? I don't know whether the CIA was asked or not, to tell you well, the Well, you wanted to find the brain, didn't you? We thought it would be nice to find it. It's not essential, however. Well, if, if it isn't essential, what would you rely on? The photographs and the x-rays. All right. Now, doctor, let's start from the beginning. Nice and easy and quiet and nice. Do you agree that ordinarily a deceased is autopsied by the medical authorities where the deceased died? That is correct. And in this case, the proper authority to autopsy the president would have been the authorities in Dallas. Isn't that true? Yes. And you knew that there was a serious struggle about that, that the president's body was simply taken from Dallas against the authority of the Dallas people and taken to the Bethesda Hospital, don't you? Yes, I've heard that. And uh, you know that there wasn't any uh, forensic pathologist at the Bethesda Hospital where he was examined, don't you? That is correct. As a matter of fact, there wasn't a board-certified forensic pathologist that undertook the autopsy of the president. Isn't that true? Yes, I would agree that. And um, is it important that autopsies be performed by somebody who has experience? Yes, of course. Would it be correct that a pathological opinion in a case can be no better than the evidence and the materials provided the pathologist? That is correct. That is why I have gone on the x-rays and the photographs. Didn't you report and didn't your committee report that the photographs that you saw of the president's brain didn't match the, didn't match the um, x-rays? Didn't you report that as a part of your report? Not to my recollection. You don't remember that. Now, this is a quotation from your panel. It certainly, referring to the pictures of the brain, did not demonstrate it certainly did not demonstrate the degree of laceration, fragmentation, or contusion Where are you reading from? that would be expected in this location if the bullet wound of entrance were as described... Where are you the, reading from? ...were as described in the autopsy report. I am reading from... Volume 7 of the House uh, report of this doctor. What you, page? What page? Page 129. It's certain, I'll read it again now without counsel's interruption, if I might. It certainly did not demonstrate the degree of what last paragraph. So I can follow you, Mr. Spence, instead of taking things please, out. That, that's the typical thing to do. What paragraph? It's on page... Uh, Volume 7, page 129. I'll even give it to counsel so he can see it. It's in yellow. Here you go, counsel. Thank you. As a matter of fact, let you and I read it together. I'll just no, you, go, you, go, you go ahead, buddy. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Dip, dip, dip. Okay. Well, anyway, you read the first word and I'll read the second. I'll no, no. It certainly does not. Damp not doctor, please listen to me. Are you aware of what's going on here, please? I'm about to ask you a question. It certainly does not demonstrate the degree of laceration, fragmentation, or contusion as appears subsequent on the superior aspect of the brain that would be expected in this location if the bullet wound of entrance were as described in the autopsy report. The majority of the panel okay. members agrees that examination of the brain itself, even now, would substantiate the opinion that he was shot from behind. Isn't that correct, sir? Excuse me. Just he's, a minute. He's just you... now skipped. He's just now skipped three. Uh, he just now skipped seventeen I... lines. 
Please Good. mark that as an exhibit. It's nice to see both of you sitting side by side. <laughs> <clears throat> Warms the cockles of my heart. Yeah, Mr. I... Thank you. There is hope for us, Judge. Thank you. <clears throat> Can we mark this as an exhibit? Please do. Exhibit A1. May I offer it into evidence, Your Honor? You may. Stand may. it to the clerk. Hand it to the clerk, please. Thank you. And may I now show it to the jury, please, so there'll be no question that I've told them the truth. Well, you can show it to the jury. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. But proceed with your now. Did you did your did your panel make that finding, Doctor? Yes. The and question... so and so, what that says is that considering the area of you uh, of the, uh, uh, where you believe this bullet entered that the brain, that is the pictures of the brain, didn't show the kinds of lacerations or contusions that you would expect. Isn't that what that says? No, sir. Well, let's it let says, the jury see if that isn't what it says. It says that the brain did not show the lacerations and contusions as would have been expected had the bullet entered where the autopsy surgeon said it entered. Yes. Now, relative to this bullet, this bullet that went, you say, through seven layers of flesh, which critics have called the magic bullet, and which I'm going to refer to as the magic bullet. Magic bullet because people don't believe that bullet can do that without <coughs> deformation. I'm going to ask you if you ever in your entire life have seen and documented a wound to a human being made by a fully jacketed military bullet fired from a Manlicker Carcano rifle, other than this case. No. May I see Exhibit 132, please? Exhibit 132 is a picture of the magic bullet. The bullets on each side are similar bullets fired into wadding. Cotton wadding. Next exhibit, please. Exhibit 108. Have you ever seen that before? I don't recognize it as such. That's no. part of the exhibit that was in your study, Doctor. Let's look at 107 and see if you recognize that. This is a cadaver's wrist, Doctor. Do you see that? Yes. Now let's look at 108. That's what the bullet looks like that went through that cadaver's wrist. The same Carcano, man liquor, rifle bullet. You know that, don't you, doctor? You saw that. That was part of your studies. Isn't that true? Um, this could very well have struck the bone in a wrist and been deformed in that way. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, Please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.